Ki ora koutou, na mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ko Glen Rowe toko o ingoa. A very warm welcome to you all. My name is Glen Rowe and it is my pleasure to introduce another of our live presentations in a series of talks for the 2020 Rassens Online Conference. If you have any questions for our speakers, please use the chat function and we'll put your questions to our speakers. Centres of Research Excellence encourage the development of excellent tertiary education-based research that is collaborative, strategically focused and creates significant knowledge transfer activities. I welcome back Dr Nick Rattenbury of the University of Auckland to present a proposal to establish the Kerr Tinsley Centre of Research Excellence. I'm just um, comment on the questions for Nick uh, as he uh, won't be available um, after his, well, after our second speaker uh, this evening. Um, please send your, any questions for him um, straight after his talk. So now over to you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Kia ora koutou katoa. Kia pai hui. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, I'd just like to give uh, a short-ish presentation summarising the work that a large fraction, if not all, of the professional astronomers in New Zealand did earlier this year. Um, uh, actually, uh, in fact, in, in the previous 12 months, so extending beyond uh, in the past uh, uh, earlier than uh, 2020, um, in, in preparing a application for a centre of research excellence. Uh, the Centre of Research Excellence would uh, have been called Kerr Tinsley, and you'll notice the, the odd tense I'm using here. The application was not successful. The Centres of Research Excellence are, as Glenn mentioned, a, a funding stream for large-scale collaborative endeavour. And I'll describe a few of the existing cores and shortly in my talk. And it was seen by the... Uh, the vast majority of professional astronomers in New Zealand that the uh, breadth and depth of astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology research in New Zealand had reached a point where it was time that we presented ourselves as a joint community to the Tertiary Education Commission, uh, Commission and say, look, if you want us to do even better and greater things, uh, now's the time to start funding astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology in New Zealand at a higher level. <clears throat> now, typically, uh, astronomers, astrophysicists and cosmologists apply to the Marsden Fund, uh, which is part of uh, the um, uh, the research portfolio for Blue Sky Research in New Zealand. The Marsden Fund is one of the uh, more modest uh, pots of money that the government has to offer for researchers, and uh, the Marsden Fund is always highly contested. There was fairly recent work which demonstrated that if the Marsden Fund were to be doubled in size, there would be no demonstrable dip in quality of research, meaning that uh, if you got to the point where you were in the second round of Marsden, all of the applicants could have been funded and the average quality of research would not have dropped. Uh, basically, that means that the Marsden Fund is underfunded by a factor of two at least. So um, every year, uh, at around about this time, in fact, we both get the results of the previous year's Marsden applications and we celebrate the successes of our colleagues. And those of us who were unlucky, we reach for our pens and paper and we start writing uh, new applications, uh, hoping to get a slice of that pie. A core, a Centre of Research Excellence, brings together researchers from all the institutions, as many of the institutions across New Zealand as possible, to uh, promote a shared vision of research in the field, in the broader field. And this is what we did, um, trying to bring together all the research that we do in New Zealand in a manner that uh, we could offer to uh, the Tertiary Education Commission and say, uh, would you care to fund us please? Because we've all got together, we're all talking to each other and we have a shared vision of how astronomy, natural physics and cosmology could be pursued in this country under a more uh, unified framework with a more secure funding basis. And so the Marsden funds usually uh, last you for maybe two, maybe three years. Uh, it does not support very well, in my opinion, 
ongoing research uh, that requires five, six, or even 10 years worth of dedicated effort. So the Kurt Tinsley Core, uh, uh, the KT Core, um, is, yeah, like I mentioned, uh, a core is not just one university or even two. You need to have as many of the institutions across New Zealand uh, who are interested or active in your research field buying into that research proposal. They support growth and research excellence. Uh, it can be anything from basic, um, which I'll refer to call fundamental research uh, through to applied research, and it's funded through the Tertiary Education Commission. Uh, Commission. So some of the existing cores you may uh, recognize here, uh, some, uh, well, we'll start at the bottom, shall we, to Punaha Matatini. Uh, you will have seen that core in the press a great deal because they are taking a, a strong lead in providing scientific evidence to the government on how to deal with the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, other notable ones, uh, the Morris Wilkins Centre, uh, the uh, MedTech Core, and the Dodd Wall Centre for Photonic and Quantum Technologies in Ontario. So these are existing cores, and we wanted the Kurt Tinsley Corps to join them. Uh, the naming, of course, is in honor of Roy Kerr and Beatrice Tinsley, two of uh, the field's most notable uh, New Zealanders. The people behind the Kurt Tinsley Corps bid in 2019 are uh, listed there, and it is the majority of the institutions uh, in New Zealand, uh, including uh, non uh, tertiary uh, academic institutions. Down the bottom there, we have Otago Museum and Stardome. There's a strong remit of the causes that the uh, science uh, and uh, other activities are disseminated to the public in a more direct fashion rather than through the rather uh, traditional means of uh, further published journal, journal articles. So we wanted to get on, uh, we wanted to learn from uh, the likes of Stardome and Otago Museum how that could be best be done. <coughs> I pulled out of the application a whole bunch of keywords, which is you know, that you use these keywords to try and align the uh, recommendation panel. They have to go away and find people who can comment on the application and set it in, in an international context and say uh, whether or not a large fraction of national treasure should be spent on this bunch of people uh, doing uh, their proposed research. And so the keywords there I'll, I'll allow you to you know, scan your eye down, but it ranges from uh, the uh, new buzzword, I suppose, new term of multi-messenger astronomy. This includes now uh, not just electromagnetic astronomy, but also gravitational wave astronomy, including Marian uh, indigenous astronomy. So we're running the gamut right from uh, the, uh, the cutting edge in new observational astrophysics through to engaging uh, Maori and indigenous peoples with um, the, the research that we uh, are doing, plus also learning from those communities on how they uh, perceive the universe and integrate those uh, concepts into our uh, ways of thinking. We include things like space technology and space physics. Naturally, these are things which have become of great interest to the country now that we have uh, a, a sovereign launch capacity through Rocket Lab. Also demonstrating the fact that we can, as New Zealanders, engage in the highest of high technology. And uh, apart from astronomy being extraordinarily seductive to a young folk, giving them an opportunity to explore the universe from their backyard, uh, we are also able to offer them the opportunity to learn how to uh, build, fly rockets and send payloads to space. <clears throat> we have uh, other activity, which is more uh, uh, conventional astrophysics, I guess, uh, planetary formation, stellar evolution, galactic astrophysics, through to the dark universe and dark matter and dark energy and neutrinos, higher energy physics, such as cosmic rays, uh, black holes, uh, tied together with numerical relativity. We're also able to draw across these fields and say, well, there are some things which uh, or some fields of study which uh, link across several of these fields but don't belong wholly within any, any of them. And these were so-called cross-cuts, uh, so-called um, because it cut across several of these uh, individual themes. And astrostatistics was one of these, the application of statistics to astronom uh, astronomical data. And we could see that there were um, uh, workers in New Zealand who are world experts in this field, and we wanted to make sure that um, their expertise was included in this in this core bid, um, strengthening every single uh, uh, avenue that we would uh, we were proposing to explore. So the intent of the Kurt Tinsley Centre of Research Excellence uh, is to unite researchers to explore and build our understanding of the universe from the beginnings of time and space 
to the skies under which we live. So no small remit, but there again, this is astronomy, uh, and, it, and therefore it encompasses, well, pretty much everything, literally. Uh, we engage all New Zealanders in the excitement of fundamental discovery, Matharanga Māori, technical innovation, and the development of a space economy. The, uh, <clears throat> the proposal was split into five themes. Uh, and so not everybody uh, in, in the group could um, um, apply themselves to each of the five themes, but certainly uh, individuals could apply themselves to more than one. Those five themes are cosmic origins and evolution, stars and galactic ecologies, planets and homes for life, Maori and indigenous astronomy, and space systems and technology. And each of the themes had uh, one or more leaders whose job it was to try and corral uh, other people who had expressed an interest uh, in, in working on uh, the, the core Tinsley bid and provide their vision of how their science would feed into um, realizing the intent and vision of the, of the core bid. So theme one, uh, the theme leaders were Yvette Perrault and David Wiltshire, and they posed themselves, they posed the straightforward questions. Uh, what is the universe made of and how do structures in the universe grow? And so this, uh, the, the sub uh, fields underneath there in smaller text, uh, you can see that it, it uh, ranges from the involvement of, of magnetic fields in large scale uh, structures through to tests of uh, general theory, the general theory of relativity. Uh, using black hole shadows, uh, looking at, again at um, inspiring masses uh, as two masses inspire together and just testing uh, to even more um, precision uh, the predictions of Einstein's general theory of relativity, and also looking at early universe cosmology. Uh, here is the larger list of people who are involved um, in, the, uh, in, in the bid. Um, And throughout the um, throughout the bid, what we tried to do was just highlight a few things which uh, interest each of the themes uh, as an exemplar, I suppose, of the sort of research which could be done once uh, the the research is funded at a significant level, which would be um, made available by a TEC core fund. And here's one uh, where uh, we propose all the workers in theme one proposed to uh, continue to use or develop the uh, the LISA, the Laser Interferometric Space Antenna mission, looking at ever more, uh, to ever more uh, uh, high precision, the effects of gravitational waves as they pass through the solar system. Uh, this would have been led by Renate Meyer, uh, including 11 of the people um, who are part of the LISA collaboration. Theme two was looking at stars and galactic ecologies, uh, led by JJ Eldridge and uh, Willem van Straten. Uh, and they're uh, principally interested in stars, their structure, evolution, and fate, uh, looking at how uh, galactic enrichment can um, affect stellar populations and vice versa. Uh, the rotation and binarity, uh, so down at the, the singular st uh, stellar system level, through to larger conglomerations of stars and how they interact with each other and the importance of binarity in particular. Uh, looking also at uh, more binary systems, but how neutron stars get kicked out of uh, supernovae systems and through to radio science, radio physics. We're looking at Ryberg abitums and talking about the, um, the stellar nurseries uh, and also through to the higher energies such as cosmic rays, how they propagate through the galaxy and uh, affect interstellar medium. So the theme two researchers here are listed and you can uh, scan your eye down and find your uh, find your favorite professional astronomer. <clears throat> and here a uh, another um, a highlight out of the bid of what uh, of an example of just one of the things that uh, the theme two researchers proposed to do if we won the KT uh, core bid, um, uh, including uh, taking a look at the Gaia satellite data and combining that with uh, radio observation uh, data combined with follow-up observations at the Mount John Observatory. Uh, also making use of uh, la large data sets uh, to take a look at stellar populations and infer uh, characteristics of those stellar populations. Again, this is where you'll be uh, looking at including things like astrostatistics to make uh, statistical statements about those broad populations. 
with a view to figuring out you know, what a galaxy is made up of. Apart from stars, how do those stars interact with each other and other larger agglomerations of stars within the galaxy? How do they feed into uh, the galactic evolution cycle? Theme three was uh, led by Michael Orbrow uh, Planets and Homes for Life, uh, looking at uh, what is required for the development of um, uh, planetary systems, plus also uh, the effect of uh, stellar uh, environments on uh, those uh, planetary surface environments. So, for instance, looking at uh, plasma environments around the star and how uh, that uh, influences the environment around uh, on a planetary surface, an atmosphere, uh, looking at formation motion. So this is looking at um, particle particle interactions and gas particle interactions, uh, how they combine uh, and to uh, how they have to be combined to uh, predict the existence or predict the um, emergence of planetesimals, forming planetoids, forming planets in the planetary formation processes. Uh, considering <clears throat> to what extent interstellar objects affect planet formation and also looking for the planets themselves. Uh, the research is here, uh, led by Michael uh, and including me in this one and Ian Bond, uh, interested in the, uh, applying our researching uh, researches uh, within the model collaboration as part of a much bigger um, uh, a theme uh, stretching across a large number of sub-disciplines loosely contained around the looking for planets and homes for life. You can see how these themes are actually very, very broad. Um, and the well, one of the advantages of having a core like this is that um, individual researchers working within their subdiscipline will be working more frequently and closer together with other researchers within their, their own theme, plus with researchers from other themes. So this is part of the um, uh, the impetus or the reason uh, for the cause is that they bring people together and uh, expect that the, these collaborations are, uh, are fostered and new research developments uh, are made. So the core, it doesn't, um, a funded core um, isn't uh, necessarily bound to uh, the, the research proposal that, that, that is submitted. The, um, <clears throat> the terms of reference for the core allow for emergent research to occur so if if a, if a group of people within the theme suddenly realize that hey this is a, a fascinating cross fertilization of ideas and i think that we've got an interesting research path to take and nobody thought about it in the the research bid then let's just go for it off we go um that that sort of thinking is is to be encouraged and that's what the core uh, funding allows <coughs> here again um a highlight out of the theme uh, this is um, a, a, a plot showing uh, uh, existing and, and predicted uh, planet mass discoveries uh, by planet mass on the y-axis and orbital radius on the x-axis, looking at um, what we expect to find in future observational surveys, including uh, the Wide Field Inf uh, Infrared Survey Telescope, the Nancy Roman Grace Telescope, the Space Telescope that will be performing microlensing observations uh, from space, and the theme uh, members would be involved in this as just one of many examples of the sort of work uh, that we would be uh, doing under that theme. Theme four, Marian Indigenous Astronomy, the leaders, uh, Rangi Matamatua, uh, Pauline Harris, and Heme Afanga, uh, uh, looking at um, um, how Māori uh, astronomical ritual and practices are realised in the modern context, how Maramataka is being implemented and integrated in a modern context, and how Māori astronomical knowledge is embedded in the landscape. So the, it, it, there's a very clear, strong and uh, coherent message coming from government that uh, Vision Mataranga uh, must be a part of any uh, government funded or contested bid, and the calls are, are no different. So our uh, obligations under Teterity uh, are very clear and uh, New Zealand is lucky in that we have uh, the likes of Pauline uh, running uh, smart, uh, investigating and doing active research in um, uh, astronomy from Te Ao Māori and uh, linking that both from the, the uh, historical perspective through to a modern perspective. And so our research is there, as I mentioned, uh, they're all leaders within the theme, uh, uh, Pauline, Rangi and Hemi. 
And uh, one of uh, the example pieces of work that which will be enabled by the theme is uh, uh, under theme four will be to uh, further investigate the significance of Matariki, uh, the Māori New Year, noting that over the last 30 years, uh, there has been a, a revitalization of uh, Matariki as being a celebration uh, um, uh, that is uh, uh, held within Te Māori, which is now spread out to encompass and um, um, all of New Zealand Aotearoa. And uh, the, the research within Theme 4 will be to expand on that and take a look and see uh, to what extent other uh, astronomical-focused celebrations and uh, uh, um, aspects of Te Māori uh, can be revitalised and can inform and instruct our understanding of uh, Te Māori, both past and present. Team five is on space systems and technology, and I was the leader on that one. Um, I kept my uh, my interests and goals, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the 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 subtopics within uh, theme five quite straightforward. Um, I wanted to build New Zealand's first space telescope. Uh, I want to uh, uh, see space plasma investigations continue in space. Uh, looking at how life processes occur in microgravity, and also want to uh, explore other planets. Uh, so the group, uh, Theme 5, uh, includes a number of people, both uh, space systems engineering uh, people, plus also um, full-on uh, astronomers and astrophysicists. And uh, one of the topics that we wanted to uh, uh, pursue as part of the, the funded core was to develop a, a small basic satellite platform which would be available for uh, will be easily available to all New Zealanders uh, wishing to design and build a satellite payload. And the experience we've had with the Auckland Program for Space Systems over the last four years is that no such thing exists. Uh, there are any number of uh, commercial suppliers who will supply you satellite hardware saying it's all plug and play. It's all a lie. Nothing is plug and play. We would be um, interested in developing something which was more um, uh, straightforward to understand and easy to develop in an open source, open hardware philosophy, allowing users to get um, and get involved with the hardware and the software at the fundamental level and allowing uh, people as a group to develop that system together rather than having it hidden behind uh, proprietary uh, intellectual property uh, uh, restrictions. So that is all I wanted to say about uh, the core. It is a shame that it was not um, it was not funded. The leaders of the core bid were Jenny Adams, Richard Easter, and David Wiltshire. They were uh, thoroughly patient with all the team leaders, um, um, uh, waiting for us to to to, to whip our, our our teams into shape and get words written on paper by the deadline. Uh, and uh, Jenny Richard and David's uh, work I wanted to celebrate uh, in this fashion just to give you a, a nice overview of some of the research which has been uh, contemplated by uh, the um, astrophysicists, astronomers and cosmologists working more um, uh, working in their independent res uh, institutions. What happens next? Uh, well, it's very difficult to uh, speculate what happens next with uh, TEC funding, particularly for the cause. Um, I would like to think that a, uh, a future bid will be made by uh, the Kurt Tinsley, uh, the people who are involved with the Kurt Tinsley core. Uh, the actual topic might be a little bit different, but um, uh, it, was, it was fun being a part of this. And it is extraordinary to see the development of uh, astronomy, astrophysics and cosmology in New Zealand develop to, to this point that we can write a document like this, which um, I certainly am quite proud to be a part of. Thank you very much indeed for uh, your time. Um, I think I've got a little bit of time for some quick questions, if um, if if anybody has them. We okay, thanks. On the chat. Yeah, oh, sorry, Glenn. It's all right. <laughs> okay, thanks for that, Nick. Um, just in case something does come through, uh, a question from me. So in, um, in the... Uh, information you got for the from being turned down for the bid, do they indicate uh, areas that could be addressed um, in any future bids or uh, what? Yeah, but it's only ever in the broadest terms uh, and uh, the mm, 
the, the, the feedback you, you tend to you, t you try and get feedback from as many people before you submit the thing. So people who have been successful in previous calls, obviously, and you try and you know, get as much feedback possible as you can because you recognize that the there is no score sheet for this. There is no grade. There is no um, you know, uh, specific set of, of, of feedback which uh, drills down into the minutiae of what you, you could have done. So there's only ever very broad uh, overarching um, feedback if it's given. Uh, so you get something, but it's not, well, it, it depends on how, yeah, you, you end up second guessing yourself um, with the feedback that you receive going, well, I wonder if I could have written that thing differently or whether or not the feedback actually applies or not. So it, it can be quite um, unsatisfactory as a, as, as a process, but. All right. This is so this is this is, is, a it is what it is. I, I point out, this is a personal view. Is not the not the view of uh, the, the the main authors of the <laughs> of, of the of the grant. All right. Okay. Is there any anything in the chat, Steve? Uh, no, nope, nothing in the chat. So you get off lightly tonight, Nick. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much okay. for listening. Yep. Thanks, Nick. We'll let you get away to other important duties. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. All right. Yeah. Okay, so now we have a second talk this evening, so I'd like to introduce Dr. Ed Budding, who's going to describe a collaborative program of studies of southern eclipsing binary stars that has involved spectroscopic observations, photometric data, as well as resources available on the internet, together with appropriate software development. Over to you, Ed. Uh, thanks very much, Glenn. Uh, is, is everything uh, hunky dory with the presentation? Yeah, okay. Um, if, just before I go to the slides, let me just say thanks to the um, people who've been organizing things behind the scenes here. Um, it's good to be, uh, th there is something in the way of the RSNZ annual conference. Uh, going ahead again, despite the challenges that have been around and affecting everyone this year, I guess. Um, and um, it's it's something to look forward to, and I hope that uh, this may be a pointer for future meetings, perhaps this this kind of technology uh, that's that allows uh, remote friends and associates to to gather in this way. So thanks to the organisers. Uh, thanks to the members of the um, society who are taking an interest in all this, I hope. Uh, and now mihi nui, hairi, So, with those uh, thoughts, let's get into this uh, talk, which will be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of some stars of interest. Let me just, I have to do that. And how's that? Oh, what happened? But I've uh, lost, I've lost my screen. No, but I, I, I can't, uh, just a minute. Yeah, so what, um, let's try sharing the screen again. What's happened? Okay, that's it. Right. And you can see me, can you? Okay. Okay, so um, it's mentioned of collaborative studies. Um, you mentioned eclipsing binaries, um, uh, Glenn. N not all 
close banners eclipse as we shall see but um and sometimes uh, only just but uh, close banner systems in general can offer interesting lines of thought for astrophysics uh, and interesting data paths um who are the, this collaborations involved with uh well i mentioned here some uh, maybe not all those who are not included i hope will forgive but um the vss used to be the variable star section of the isnz it still has links it's called variable star south now university of canterbury is also involved with this uh, an interesting observatory known as the sestora observatory which uh, you met last week i think with tom uh, and was rag that's wellington astronomical society and my old friends in turkey who i've worked with over the last decade or so the tanzacs from gallipoli um we'll see what turns up in the subsequent slides uh, that unites these uh, groups uh, so the key bit on this slide is in red i guess um and uh, we've been extremely lucky i think to have had um a facility like uh, the the high resolution um Hercules spectrograph Mount John Observatory to bear on some of these post binary systems um wonderful facility as well as when we combine that sort of data with photometric data from the VSS uh, then we embark on what Henry Norris Russell referred to as the royal road combination of various data streams which can probe into the parameters and properties of, of real stars and i'll be talking a bit we mentioned already binary stars let's just refresh minds a little bit on this just in case uh needs a reminder maybe not but anyway we have two stars uh orbiting around the common center of mass in in the more general perspectives perhaps but often we, we regard one star as primary, perhaps the more massive, the lower mass star here. And we speak of the relative orbit of the secondary around the primary, which is just a scaled up version of one of these orbits. And as we mentioned, many of these stars uh, in close binary systems are so oriented that the line of sight is close to the plane of the orbit. And then we can see these eclipses when the star, which is intrinsically brighter per unit area surface is eclipsed, then the um, minimum is deeper, uh, the primary minimum, as it's called. And th this is all fairly intuitive and I guess reasonably well known. Um, my old teacher in Manchester, before I came to New Zealand n years ago, was an expert in this particular field, wrote a very um, seminal work on it, uh, Zdenek Kopal was honored with a memory postage stamp in um, his native Czechoslovakia. Um, so I mentioned these facilities. Um, here's the Hercules spectrograph, um, great leviathan of instruments in its own special temperature controlled room, vacuum sealed environment, high grade um, components in that spectrograph, allowing very high dispersion uh, images and sensitive chip to record um, the data that we're interested in. Uh, this will remind you, some people, of the old days of Frank Bateson, the variable star section as it was, born in the, uh, in the RSNZ fold, I believe, certainly brought the RSNZ to international attention. The Sistor Observatory, roll-off roof style. Um, so we've got citizen science coming into this, as well as uh, satellites like Hipparchus and TESS, 
and his data is freely available by internet. We shouldn't forget the important role of internet in all modern science. Um, Carter Observatory here is to remind the historic connection with the WAS Society, and they have their own special little research group, um, which has uh, directed attention to some of these stars for monitoring. As we, as we shall see, uh, it has sometimes uh, special use, a special purpose within the field. The first star that we're going to mention, uh, perhaps uh, three or four, four or five, if time permits, is this system in the great uh, Carina Nebula, quite near the Pihon Nebula. This star here, uh, QZ Carina, has a special um, status within New Zealand astronomy, I think, because uh, some 50 years ago now, its variability was first announced from the Auckland Observatory by Stan Walker and Brian Marino discovered the eclipsing nature of this pair. You see, we're dealing here with a very complicated arrangement. Well, it's not that complicated, but, but tricky enough to, de to decipher um, of two binaries around a uh, common center of gravity, a quaternary system, uh, a, a pair of binaries that in itself is, is kind of like a wide binary with, with uh, two double components. When this, um, this diagram comes from uh, a paper in about 10 years ago, nine years ago, um, the period of this wide system was estimated to be less than 25 years. Um, but in, important evidence from um, the mainly amateur variable star observing community has revealed that this period is in perhaps of the order of double, a bit more than double this, this estimate from bygone days in literature. So system B, slightly less massive, less massive, is the one that was discovered as eclipsing. Uh, the, the other binary is not eclipsing uh, and a longer period, somewhat separated stars. Now this is a kind of data which comes from uh, the Hercules spectrograph. Um, this is one of the orders. These are separate observations made on, on different nights, or I guess mostly different nights, of the helium-1 feature at 6678 angstroms. And you can see, I think, if you just look at this red one here, you can see that there's two um, features there, two absorption features separated, shifted by the Doppler effect. This is the key thing in this type of spectral investigation of close binary systems. The Doppler effect is telling us what the velocity of these stars are. Um, here we see this secondary star, as it seems, on the right, so redward, so receding. This one is advancing. And here, the other way around, the, the, you might well think this is a binary system. Um, because of the secondary shifting more than the primary. But in fact, we have the two stars of alternate stars of both binaries. The, the one star is the primary of, of the wide system. And this uh, other, other feature belongs to the brighter star in the eclipsing system. So you've got quite a bit of um, sorting out to do with whether how you interpret the velocity movements in relation to the two orbits when you're deciphering information like this. But it, it, the early investigators thought that this was going to be a, an extremely difficult nut to crack. And because of the fact that we only see one star in each binary, um, deriving masses and radii, these absolute parameters here, which are key interest to, to, to um, bringing theory into line with observation, so theoreticians are interested in how well these masses and radio can be specified, whether it fits in with the general scenario of what's going on in the stars. Um, but it's a difficult job when you, you've only got part of the information, and not from both stars um, in, in, the, in the given binary. So uh, the extra ingredient which we, which we um, brought to bear on this 
and this has been provided by VSS members to a very large extent. This is the long period O minus C curve. I can just briefly explain what that is. O minus C is the observed time of minimum, uh, take away the calculated time of minimum, because you know what the period is, you know what, what the time of eclipse. So if you've got the period of the time of eclipse, you can just prolong, reduce that, extend it into the um, into future dates, predict when those minima will occur. In fact, they don't occur to time, they get shifted. As a result of the light time effect, as it's called, the, t the time taken for light to travel across the wide orbit. And this was um, the extra bit of information that, the, that mainly amateur astronomers brought to bear on this system and uh, helped to quantify more precisely what the masses and, and sizes of the stars are going to be. That, the geometry uh, and physical characteristics of this quaternary system. Timing of minima is using um, something as simple as uh, a Canon double um, digital single lens reflex camera available sort of more or less universally about highly sensitive chips um, and you can um, and streamline the way the observations are handled so that produce uh, three color photometry from the one chip um, and uh, a large number of individual data points. So you get good signal to not when you bin all the, this data points together, you can get very well defined times of minima. Um, this kind of observation data is made available here through Mark Blackford of the uh, Variable Star section, of Variable Star South, part of a greater project on binary systems. Uh, but also, Mark um, uh, was an active proposer in relation to this data, which comes from the Bright satellite, which relates quite a bit, I think, to what um, Nick was saying in this uh, earlier talk on space technology, because uh, I don't know much about this myself, but here's here's one of the satellites we're talking, this is kind of budget space astronomy, um, and it, it's a result of a collaboration between Canada and some East European institutions and th this low mass satellite uh, contains, I guess, facilities uh, comparable to the uh, DSLR type detectors. So put into space where it's a nice environment for doing an, uh, astronomy at relatively low cost. But uh, if Mark ma made a proposal for this with some assistance from other members of, of the team, if you like. Um, but this kind of opportunity is, is there and is of interest um, to, to the sort of context uh, scissors and science we're talking about, um, which I think adds, adds to its appeal. Um, and now what about the results of this? These, more recent timings are showing that uh, instead of the 50-year orbit that we predicted in the paper we pr produced in a few years ago, 2017, on this system, um, it looks like the cycle is it's kind of slowing down. The, the, the O minus C curve, which looked as though it was going to be a, a simple sinusoid a few years ago, is slowing down here. It won't get back to where it st started. Um, when Stan and Brian first observed the system in the 70s, until now we are thinking more like 2028. What is this period? Why is it of significance? Well, you may remember uh, Kepler's third law, which relates the period to the separation and the masses of the system. The separation you can somehow get a, a an idea about from the separate spectrometric evidence that exists. We didn't know the period. This will then enable us to get the sum of the two mass regarding the, the two binaries as two individual components of, a, of the wide system. You can apply this Kepler's law, you can get the sum of the two masses and the two components, you see what I mean. And so this is kind of a, a, a bit of the jigsaw puzzle that's missing. And this was, I think it's, uh, it's inspiring to think that this has been uh, built up over 
a 50-year period or so, um, particularly pushed along by Stan uh, in the Auckland Observatory and um, further north, I think, these days. These days. Moving on to another star, um, here again are light codes from Mark's uh, Canon 600D, I think he has, and the, the, the one with the mosaic, um, the bio-mosaic filter that stands in, in front of the CMOS chip. You can separate the colors BVR. It's quite an interesting handy technique. And this, this look at these light curves and compare them with, say, the Hipparchus satellite or the ASSAS facility in South America. And you see these are competitive data sets. It's, it's good data, good for analysis. The, most of these stars that I'm talking about, then they all came up with some surprises for us, points of interest and intrigue. And this was no exception. We discovered in the course of this work, this, well, pretty much straight away, in fact, this um, third component hadn't been reported before. The, there's a close binary system. It's a third star too. And um, the analysis program that's been built to deal with this three-component system spectrum was put together by another member of WAS, um, Roger Butland. And um, also the optimal fitting of this uh, feature, the spectral feature. So we have the primary and secondary of the main binary in it, and we have a third star, which is, we have to sort of disentangle slight movements of that third star from these other two before we can put together the facts on on, on the 454 Carina. And this is these are the radio velocity curves. You can intuitively see, I think, the two stars of similar amplitude with radio velocity variation, so sort of comparable masses, pulling on each other sort of a comparable weight and um, uh, sizable losses. That, that it may look as though that's a bit scattered to you, um, but these are really very high quality, given that these stars are very broad and rather shallow lines, difficult to measure. Um, this is the best, perhaps the only um, uh, radio velocity curves on for the system produced so far. Uh, and then when you've combined the um, in this case, the eclipsing binary light curves of D454 Carina with the radio velocity curves, you can you can get the masses, which are between four and five, and about 4.5, 4.6, the two stars in the close binary, uh, and you can we've got with the radii are the here's the, here are best radial sizes of the stars. And what happens as stars evolve is that they go bigger, of course. We can use um, studies like the, those of the Italian group at Padova University, who have very detailed stellar models, to test modeling against these parameters. And, and from this, we can determine how old the system is. And in the case of many of these systems we're looking at, the young star, massive stars, they're in groups of stars, we can test whether this estimate of the age of the star fits in with what we think is the age of the group or cluster there, there within. And in, in many of the cases we've been studying at Mount John, and I, I think we've had, got perhaps about a score of examples now in our books, uh, we find that there's this linking theme of the so-called Gould Bell, the local large structure in the galaxy, uh, which is associated with star formation regions. Here's um, V454 Carina, we think that it may be somehow related to this Vela OB2 massive uh, star formation region in the local region of the galaxy. So it's not just uh, close stars as individual stars that, that we, we think about in this project, but it links also to the structure of the galaxy. Very thought provoking stuff. So it, it, now I mentioned that not all of these systems eclipse, and here's one that we didn't find any eclipse for them. This, we still see a variation. What is it, about 5% or something like that of the full intensity? That's a 5% variation of light. Um, associated with the tidal effect between the two stars, and we have a program to model tidal effects and it involves the same kind of parameters that go into modeling eclipsing binaries. So um, we're using the same sort of tools. Um, we don't have quite the information content in front of the light cover this type you can have when the eclipses, 
But uh, this is HX Valorum here, and it's again it's in a cluster. So we can use the cluster information, people model sequences for the cluster stars and see how that can bear on what we get out of the parameterization of the individual binary. Excuse me. Um, so here is HX Valorum associated with this huge um, active star formation region in the galaxy, the o Vela OB1 association, as it's called. And we, we link that in, and we also even thought we could determine where um, HX Valorum had started off in relation to this um, large association, but th that's more detailed than we have time for this evening, I guess. Um, here's another uh, system we've been looking at, an unusual algo type binary. Why is it unusual? Because um, it seems as though the primary is the one that is almost filling, or effectively filling its, very closely filling its Roche lobe, its lobe of limiting dynamical stability. At some point in the near future, this will start spilling matter out towards this other star, and goodness knows what will happen when there is some kind of accretion structure past process of stellar evol interactive evolution that uh, will occur at that time. This was the um, Hipparchus light curve. Now here comes the surprise. Um, I think it was Tim Banks. Some of you may remember, he used to be at Vic uh, at uh, University of Singapore, member of the team, who looking at the TESS uh, light curves, um, spotted these curious little distortions at the bottom of, what is this? Gee. This is, and turns out to be grazing eclipses, very shallow eclipses. And one star must just um, skim over the disk of the other one uh, at these conjunction phases. And that's useful because it, you know, the fact that there are eclipses gives you a good fix on the inclination of the system. So we're um, working uh, on analyzing the, the PU puppets both the test photon is extraordinarily accurate, and uh, the few dozen um, spectra that we've got on this system from Mount John in recent years. And finally, um, that we have a, a system that was recommended for our attention by A-Line and uh, John Holmes uh, from the WAS research group. Uh, citizen science group and um, what, what was the surprise here? VPUP is a pretty well-known system but look at this peculiar when we bin all the separate light curves that test produced you, you get a sort of smudgy um, pattern of data like that but uh, if you look at individual light curves when test is, is taking um, Images which start every two minutes, uh, and so you get a very full coverage of the light variation. This is actually outside the eclipse region, and you can see over a period of a few hours, you get this. We're talking about like a couple of milli magnitudes here, incipient beta Cephei type variation, early types, um, massive star that uh, is prone to this kind of behavior. And look, here's where we place the star in the hertzsprung Russell diagram as a result of the analysis of the contemporaneous um, tests and, and spectrometry. Uh, and it's just on the edge of this instability strip, as it's called, where we expect, well, or not, it, it is expected that stars can become unstable in, in, as against beta Cephei type variability. And I think... Um, uh, um, I, I met a, there are experts in this field already in New Zealand. Up the play on who's doing what in relation to the, to the, this is the music project, isn't it? Karen Pollard to discuss this kind of instability. So, so that's a challenge for us in, in preparing this uh, um, 
write up on, on this. But anyway, with those thoughts uh, in mind, that's that was with the whistle top whistle stop tour of a few interesting variables we've turned our telescopes to in the southern hemisphere, neglected close binary systems in the southern hemisphere in, in recent years. Okay, I'll finish there. Thanks. Anybody still there? Okay, thanks very much, Ed. Yes, a lot of a lot of variety yeah. there and lots of different co <laughs> contributors as well. Sorry, Ben. It's okay. <laughs> okay. So we Do don't have any questions as yet. Uh, if anybody wants to ask anything, get them in real quick. I think our audience is going, taking it easier on our speakers tonight okay. than the previous sessions. <laughs> okay, well, maybe something will come through in the post, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, try and deal with any questions uh, uh, that may arise. What, you know, maybe some people will be watching uh, on YouTube at a more convenient time, perhaps, so we'll see. Yeah. Anyway, thanks again for the opportunity to speak about this. Glenn, and I hope the rest of the conference goes as well as it seems to be going. Okay, thanks very much, Ed. Just while we give it a moment or two in case there is a last minute question, I'll just uh, do the introduction for the um, third presentation in tonight's um, session. Now, this is a pre recorded presentation by Petra Tang, who is a doctoral candidate at the University of Auckland. And the title of Petra's talk is Estimating Spectral Density for the Stochastic Gravitational Wave Background for LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. So if there's no questions, Steve, we'll... Okay, so we'll move on to well, Petra's... Then, uh, then. Is that okay? Or we'll, we'll see the recorded talk. Yes, so we'll we'll start the um, Petra's talk now. Just move that, and here she comes. Hello, everyone. My name is Petra Tang. I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. My supervisors are Professor Renata Meyer and Associate Professor John Eldridge. The topic I'm going to be talking about today is called Estimating Power Spectral Density Parameters of Stochastic Gravitational Wave Background for LISA. The outline of my talk consists of a quick introduction of properties of gravitational waves and sources and how we detect it and followed by how we studied signals and how we can reconstruct the sensitivity curve. And then we'll end up with what I will be doing next in my research. So gravitational wave is a necessity, also a necessary consequence of special relativity with its finite speed for information transfer. So gravitational wave tra travels at the speed of light and is time dependent. So on the right hand side, you can see there's two peaks that represent two binary in spiral, could be stars or black holes, and this ripples representing radiation in the form of gravitational waves. And also gravitational waves compress and stretches the space time in two directions or polarizations. Here we denote plus or cross. So they're in about half pi or 45, uh, a quarter pi or about 45 degrees phase difference. And then last but not the least, gravitational waves only weakly interact with matter. And this is why it is very hard to detect it. There are two main sources for gravitational waves. One is called an astrophysical 
sources. It could be two compact binary in spirals, um, including two binary um, neutron stars, or one neutron star, one black hole, or two black holes. And when they orbit around each other and finally merge and go through the spiral merger and rain down period, and energy would radiate away from this period in the form of gravitational waves. And here's a, a, just another um, plot about the, the um, distortion of the period in time, so the time dependent. The second source is a supernova or gamma ray burst. That's also a source of astrophysical gravitational waves. There's a supernova here. Um, and here's a pulsar in our galaxy. It's periodic, so it takes a long time to detect. So the pulsar uh, ray timing groups, so they are also looking at uh, detecting gravitational waves by looking at neutron stars that's periodically pulsating. The second source of gravitational waves is called a cosmological gravitational is waves. Um, it's basically uh, this one source for it is stochastic background. It just means that it's everything in space that we see, all sources that involve that can create gravitational waves. The jumble of signals from lots of sources, such as white dwarf binaries, massive black holes binaries at the early um, formation of the early, uh, very young universe. So this is the opportunity for us to study the history of the universe. And this is also what I'm interested in is to study the signal, the stochastic background. So how do we know it exists? Well, firstly, it solves Einstein's special relativity and it provides some kind of number here that represents the amplitude where even Einstein thought the amplitude is too small. It may never be detected. And one of the uh, first, the first indirect proof of uh, gravitational waves is through studying period of pulsar, how the period uh, of binary pulsars decrease. And then that period, and, then, and that lines up nicely with um, Einstein's general relativity prediction that the energy loses through in the form of gravitational waves. So how do we detect it? On the ground, we have um, LIGO, Virgo, GEO, Tama, uh, Auriga, LIGO, India, and there's a couple more recently they're planning to be built. Uh, try to study the distortion of the space, how the space is being um, pressed, compressed and stretched when gravitation wave goes through it. And in, and since 2016, we had only three confirmed, uh, two mergers the, to confirm the, the existence of black uh, gravitational waves. Until last month, the LIGO announced its third run, but only half of its uh, result that confirmed with 50 gravitational wave events which is very encouraging uh, to the field and we uh, await for the second announcement for the second half. And you can see on the left hand side, that's the mass of, in terms of solar mass and uh, there are black holes here, you got some neutron stars. What about in space? If, a lot of times in astronomy, um, we think what we can do on the ground, we can do it better in space. It's, just, it's the case for Hubble Space Telescope. But in this case, in terms of detecting gravitational waves, um, a space instrument complements the ground-based observatories. So this one is called LISA, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. 
Uh, it's designed by ESA, European Space Agent. So it's going to be um, three spacecrafts with the equal distance, five million kilometers apart. It will be launched in the next three to five years, and it will orbit around the sun and form roughly about 60 degrees uh, facing the sun. So what does it do? It measures a different part of the frequency of the gravitational wave waves signals. See, on the right-hand side, you have your LIGO here, and in the curve is sensitivity curve. That's a, your noise. Anything above the noise, that is the events um, the instrument should be tuned to measure. So that's, we've got different things are happening. So for LISA, we can measure really massive black hole merging or galact galactic binaries. So here is very exciting because it's um, mostly in the millihertz frequencies. However, LIGO is in about 1000 kilohertz frequencies. Now here's a, a better view of uh, the spectrum of gravitational waves rather than the spectrum of um, electromagnetic waves. And we have the gravitational waves in terms of um, frequency here. And you can see the red image above that. You got millihertz region. That's where um, LISA instrument is tuned to. And that's what I'm interested in. So what if we receive some signal? And here is some signal and it's time dependent at the bottom. It's in seconds. And on the left hand side, that is amplitude in meters. So the, the amplitude is very small. It's in the 10 to the negative 19 meters. So this consists of both the noise, whatever noise in space, or maybe the instrument of LISA, or the things we want to study. In this case is the cosmological sources of gravitational waves, AKA the stochastic gravitational wave background. So that gives us information of those really big black holes or galact galactic binaries. So what do we do? So firstly, to do with the signals, we always try to, um, if it's time dependent, it was converted into frequency dependent. So uh, fast forward transform, we're looking at frequency from 0 to 0 0.1, uh, which is uh, within the frequency band of LISA. Remember, LISA is in millihertz. So here's the, um, the plot on the left hand side, is the amplitude again. You can see maybe something's happening here. Yeah, maybe. And what do we do next? Well, in order to study the, the signal, very often we study the spectrum density or power spectrum density. Um, so what we do is we're gonna construct that. So physicists and engineers, they have come up with this top two functions that absorbs or summarizes these two type of noises within the instru instrument of LISA. So first one is called the optic noise, which is frequency dependent and depends on this parameter called P. And everything else is just a uh, constant. You have to this, this is unit, unit. Um, hertz, again, there's your frequency on the right hand, there's a speed of light, C. And then the second type, um, so sorry, the, the, the function for optic, uh, noise, it's for uh, smaller, slightly smaller frequencies in the millihertz band. And slightly for the other, the bigger frequencies comparatively, it's called acceleration noise. So this noise is also frequency dependent and also depends on parameter A. Right. Now, the P, this one, is a one sided, a power spectrum density of the instrument noise, which is a function of F and uh, depends on the parameter P and A. And L here is the arm length in uh, the instrument LISA. Now here we know it's a five million kilometers. However, you may think 
they must move a little bit. How can we be sure that they are constant distant omelets? But that's for just for another day. At the moment, we're going to assume L is a constant. It's five million kilometers. Right, so that's the setup. And Sn represent the noise spectrum density. The noise spectral density is the power spectrum density of the, the noise dividing by this response function is property of the instrument. Now here we can construct the um, square root of the um, power spectral density of the, of the noise, uh, which is frequency de uh, dependent. And the black line here is just a, a approximation. If you go back a slide, you can see you got your cosine and, and sine here. So that's when we have those the green features here. So anything above this line, it should be detectable. So we want to know whether the signals uh, we can recover is within this region. Now, we have the noise. What about the, the stochastic gravitational wave background signal? Now, the, we're going to use uh, the fractional energy density as an example. So the gravitational wave energy density is in the forms of um, S he SH here is the signal, the density, the spectral density of the signal and the times by all these different constants. H is the cosmological constant and F is frequency. And here um, we reduce it. There's something maybe some people are familiar with this form is a power law form. So we have amplitude and here is the slope. So that means we have two parameters. So here's amplitude and slope that controls the profile of the stochastic gravitational wave signal. So, so far what we have, we have the noise signal, we have the parameter P and A. And what about for the gravitational wave background? We have slope and amplitude. Now some assumptions let's just mention here. So we're gonna assume that the stochastic wave background is isotropic Gaussian with mean zero. In reality, of course, we also, also need to visit the non-Gaussian part, but that's maybe for another time. Now, what do we do once we have parameters? So we want to recover those parameters and reconstruct the profile. So the method I'm using is Bayesian parameter estimation. So famous equation, the posterior equals likelihood, likelihood times prior, divided by evidence. So here you can ignore that. So it's a proportional to likelihood times prior. So basically, if you are using R or JAGS or C, um, you can, they are different um, software, different packages can help you to run MCMC. So what I'm using here is called PyMC3. And I've used the mock lisa data challenge data um, so here i have my prior so there are four parameters i need to set four priors i have my omega beta and beta so that's my amplitude beta is my slope and p and a here and what do i have so i've i've recovered the four parameters, and they are fairly close to the true parameters. Since the mock lisa it's the true parameter values are known, so I can compare with them and look at and method, whether my method works or not. So that's, so this one is uh, my, sorry, this one is the, um, uh, the lisa challenge data one is a fairly close. Uh, for the slope and, sorry, um, this one's very close. All four parameters recovered 
uh, nicely. So this is the posterior distribution of all four parameters. So that's the highest point where, where those four numbers coming from. Right hand side is the trace plot of the MCMC. And what about if we look at the challenge data, that's the mixed um, noise and signal that we want. And we found that we can still recover the shape of the power law, but we don't know anything about the noise, uh, which is a challenge here. So we can still recover the shape of the signal, but we don't know anything about noise. So that's, I think is why it's so interesting because we have to understand what consists um, of noise in this case. Right, once I can recover some of the parameters, um, if I walk backwards, let for example, this case, I'm looking at the noise po um, power spectrum density. Uh, the red line representing the uh, approximation from, from theory and the purple lines uh, indicating the 90% uh, confidence interval of my um, recovered parameters that I reconstructed power spectrum density. You can see it's not too bad. It's fairly consistent. And there's another one that shows the red one is the approximation based on a frequency and the purple one is a 90% confidence interval of the recovered noise from my uh, um, uh, my mock data. So the problem is I can't really recover uh, the correct noise parameters from the mock Lisa challenge because I don't know how the mock Lisa ch challenge uh, generated the noise. I don't know what kind of noise they have. And here I'm shows you why that fails. So horizontal axis, axis, uh, x-axis, you have your frequency, left-hand side, that's amplitude. So this is um, the power law per se, um, that you can see that it's completely off. This is the purple is my estimation of the 90% interval. There's a lot of errors in it. All right, so what does that mean? Maybe it means that Power law doesn't work for stochastic wave background, which um, is well known. We believe that if you look at um, different events and you realize that for gravitational, uh, stochastic gravitational wave background, we can't use power law anymore, it's more complicated. And also there are many unknown noise, noises involved in terms of signal, which we don't know, therefore it's hard to um, parameterize it. What can we do? Now, one of the things we can do is to use binary population synthesis result to, to create a more realistic signal. Um, for example, we can use BPAS um, to, to just take into account the main uh, phenomenon, main events, and start, start simple and make it more complicated um, step by step. Another thing we can do is to use spline method. We can use P spline or B spline to split this, uh, the profile of the, the sensitivity curve or uh, of the signal into smaller chunks and then assume power law within each bin and then reconstruct the, the final profile. The next step uh, after that, maybe um, we can introduce a semi-parametric or non-parametric Bayesian method, which is uh, more flexible, um, considers the infinite number or very large number of parameters that we may miss. And that's going to be for, um, hopefully, my PhD will get to that stage and I'll be able to learn and contribute to the field a bit more uh, using non-parametric Bayesian method. Gravitational waves bring in for information about objects that cannot be seen with electromagnetic observation 
and vice versa. There's radically different fields than electromagnetic observations. Measuring a lens smaller than proton size is no longer a science fiction, as you can see in previous slides. We can measure it. We have done it. We'll talk about signals and sources that are known about, that we know about. And new field has its own surprises. For example, radio, um, gamma ray. There are known knowns. There are known unknowns. But there are also known unknowns. Thank you very much. Yep, just turn myself back on. Okay, that was a fascinating talk from Petra. Uh, it was very good of her to provide that pre-recorded talk. And um, with that, I'll just check in with you, Steve. Were there any questions for, no, no for more, Ed no during the time? Everybody very quiet tonight. Okay, oh, well, that brings this evening's session to a close then. And... Um, invite you to yeah. tune again next Tuesday and we'll have another session. Can I like another... just uh, offer a question you know, about the sources of the noise? I mean, did she have any uh, thoughts about the physical sources of such noise? You know, whether uh, the... Uh... Um, yeah, sorry, Ed. Petra's talk was a pre-recorded one, so she's not available to answer any questions. Ah, yeah, but you were expecting some questions to be asked anyway, were you? It doesn't matter. I mean, no. I was just curious about any, you know, sources of, of what would be very minute disturbance in the interferometer mirrors from, uh, you know, the space environment or, or the fact that it wouldn't be presumably too far away from the Earth. I, I don't know how far... It actually is planned. It is, no. uh, <coughs> but you know, there'll be tidal uh, shifts due to components of the Earth moving, and it's planking a very, very minute effect. So, so. anyway, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll well, think I more about okay. that and perhaps uh, send something if 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 uh, questions are being collected um, remotely, then perhaps. Uh, uh, at a later date, then perhaps I can chip in with something. Yes, you better to catch up with yeah. Petra another time. So, okay, with that, uh, we'll call uh, this evening's session to a close. Uh, ka kite anō. Ka kite anō. Good night. <laughs>